why don't we start in thanksgiving to the Lord. Has God been good to you this week? Amen. God has been so good. Let's start in prayer. Oh, we bless you, Lord. Father, we thank you. We thank you, Lord. Oh, we bless you. Come on, church. Let's lift our voice in worship. Thank you, Lord. Thank you. Oh, thank you for your goodness. Thank you for keeping us, sustaining us, maintaining us. Lord, thank you for providing. Thank you, Lord, for protecting. Lord, thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you for what you have done and what you're doing in our lives. Thank you for our family. Thank you for your provision. Oh, thank you. Thank you for your word. Thank you for Jesus. Thank you for the blood. Oh, that wash away all of our sins. Oh, thank you, Lord, that we can come boldly in your throne of grace to obtain mercy. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. We love you. We bless you. Oh, we exalt your name. We glorify your name only. We magnify your name. You truly are worthy. Worthy to be praised. Worthy to receive glory and honor and praise. Lord, we thank you. It's all about you. That's why we came to worship you only. To hear your word and to declare your greatness in our midst. Because you've been so good. We thank you. Oh, thank you. Thank you that this is the day that you have made. We will rejoice and be glad in it. Oh, we thank you. We thank you. We thank you, Lord. We bless you, Lord. We worship you. Oh, we thank you for what you're about to do in our midst. Because you know, we know you are in our midst right now. When two or three are gathered in your name, you are in our midst. Have your way, Holy Spirit. And we commit everything to you and giving you all the glory and honor and praise. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Oh, we bless your name. Thank you, Lord. Oh, thank you. Thank you. Thank you for all the great things you have done. Thank you, Jesus. church come let us bow at his feet he has done great things see what our savior has done see how his love overcomes he has done great things he has done great things
things in our lives. Amen? Amen. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Philippians um, 2, 9, it says, Therefore, speaking of Jesus, because he stooped so low, God has highly exalted him and has freely bestowed on him the name that is above in every name, above every name. That at the name of Jesus, every knee should bow in heaven on earth and under the earth. And every tongue will openly confess and acknowledge that Jesus Christ is Lord. To the glory of God the Father. Amen. just want to speak the name of Jesus. Come on, church. Over every heart and every mind. Because I know there is peace within your presence. I speak Jesus. I just want to speak the name Jesus, over dark addiction starts to break, declaring there is hope and there is freedom, I speak Jesus, your name is power, your name is healing. Just wanna speak the name of Jesus. Yes. Over fear and all anxiety. To every soul held captive by depression. I speak Jesus. Jesus from the mountains, Jesus in the streets, Jesus in the darkness over every enemy, 
Jesus for my family. I speak the holy name of Jesus. Shout Jesus from the mountain. Jesus in the street. Jesus in the darkness over every enemy. Jesus for my I worship you, yes, Lord. 
not sin because we walk by faith and not by sight oh looking unto Jesus the author and finisher of our faith knowing that God is willing and able to do what he has promised because even when I don't see it you're working even when I don't feel it you're working you never stop never stop working you never stop you never stop working even when I don't see it you're working even when I don't feel it you're working you never stop you never stop working you never stop
spirit of worship, church. Praise you, Lord. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Praise you, God. You know, Psalm 103 says, Praise the Lord, my soul. All my inmost being, praise his holy name. Psalm 150, we, we love this scripture. It says, Let everything that has breath praise the Lord. What an amazing, beautiful declaration. Amen, church. Let everything that has breath praise the Lord. You know, we love quoting that scripture, but sometimes we, we miss the true meaning of that scripture. Because we think of it as God's people giving praises. But the meaning of that scripture is the, it's about the one who gives breath. Amen. Breath symbolizes life. You know, God says in the book of Genesis that he breathed into the nostril. He breathed. He breathed the, the breath of life. Amen. And also that breath symbolizes God's spirit in you. Amen, church. You know, how many of you know that we don't own our own life? Right? It's of the Lord's. All the heavens and the earth is of the Lord's. And someday we will stand before the Lord and we will be held accountable of the kind of life that we live for God. Amen. So I have a question for you as we just sang these songs. Are you living a life for God, for God and with God? Do you love the Lord with all your heart, church, with all your soul, with all your strength? Hallelujah. You know, my brothers and sisters, if everything is of the Lord's, I got good news for you that he knows what you're going through right now. Amen. Your troubles, frustrations, your doubts. Maybe you have a lot of questions in your life. You know, if you, but how many of you know that God would always be bigger than our problems. Amen, church. Amen. Amen. Hallelujah. You know, but the Bible gave us a warning. It says that the thief come to steal and kill and destroy. Amen. So the enemy before he attacks, you know, he tends to isolate us. Okay, like a lion. And maybe there's someone out there who's being isolated by the enemy. But how many of you know that, that God can use a community of believers just like Crossroads today? Amen. To be the channel of his love, his strength, and his protection. So if it's okay, church, before we hear the word of God, before I do our offering, uh, just for 30 seconds, if you could pray for that person next to you, just for 30 seconds, just pray for that person right now. And I would ask for you to pray for three things for that person. Pray for protection. You pray for that person's provision. You pray for that person's peace amen you know pray for protection for from any sickness and any harm in Jesus name hallelujah pray for provision that God will supply all their needs and for that peace that transcends all understanding hallelujah thank you Lord praise you Lord God Lord thank you for thy presence this morning thank you lord for your manifest presence thank you holy spirit lord you you heard the the cries and prayers of your people i don't know what they're going through lord but you know because you know everything lord god lord i pray that we will have that special encounter with you this morning lord and i pray the holy spirit that you minister to us and that the, the indwelling the outpouring of the holy spirit will be in us as we listen to your living word this morning. And we give you all glory, honor, and praise, Lord, because you deserve it all. You deserve all our praises, Lord God. Thank you for your word. Thank you for your promises that you have spoken over your people. Thank you, Father God. This is our prayer in the mighty name of Jesus. And everyone will say amen and amen. Let's give the Lord a clap of praise. Shout of praise. Hallelujah. Before you take your seats, if you can turn to that person and tell them, your best is yet to come. In Jesus' name. And you shake hands and high five. Thank you, church. Good morning, church. It's always good to be in the house of the Lord. Amen. Are you glad to be in the house of the Lord this morning? Thank you, praise and worship team. All glory to God. Welcome to our service. And we're so happy that you're here this morning, but we know it's God who brought you here. Are you, are you glad that God woke you up this morning? 
Amen. Every day, His grace and mercies are new every morning. Uh, any guests, first time here at Crossroads this morning? Or second timers? So we just want to welcome you. Maybe you're viewing for the first time. Welcome to Crossroads. Welcome home. And uh, we're just going to uh, start uh, dive into our announcements. So, you know, first off, uh, April is actually Volunteer and Workers Appreciation Month. Any workers, church workers, volunteers here? Could you raise your hand? Amen. Praise God. We just want to uh, thank God for you and for your uh, whatever you're doing in God's kingdom. Uh, department heads meeting this afternoon right after the service. Uh, and also, we have our prayer meeting here on Wednesdays. So we don't gather only on Wednesdays. I mean, on Sundays, but also on Wednesdays at 730 and I was reminded by Brother Arias. Brother Arias, could you raise your hand? He's the president of our men's ministry. They meet here every Thursday at 730. So men, if you want to get involved, listen to the word and fellowship, please come back here uh, on Thursdays, 730. And it doesn't end there. On the screen are different ministries if you want to get involved, the times of their meetings. So take a, a screenshot. Uh, we just want to get to know you, right? And we just want to, there's a lot of things going on in the world right now. So what a best way, uh, there's no better way just to really serve and get to know the Lord more in Jesus' name. Amen, church? Amen. Um, now that you receive, how many received from the Lord this morning? Amen. Uh, now that you receive from the Lord, are you ready to worship the Lord in our giving? Amen. Uh, I know you just sat down, but we always say that giving is an act of worship. And when we worship the Lord, we always stand, right? So if you're physically able, if you can stand up once again with me. Uh, as we bless our tithes and offerings here. Hallelujah. Praise you, Lord God. If you can close your eyes and bow your heads, would you pray with me, church? Father God, we give you thanks and we bless your name this morning, Lord. Lord, truly you are worthy of all our praises, Lord. Lord, we thank you for thy goodness and thy faithfulness, Father God. And your plans, your plans and purpose, Father God, in our lives. Father God, we pray that you bless these tithes and offerings, Lord that they may be used to further thy kingdom. Search our hearts, Lord, because we know it's all about the heart, Lord. And Lord, I pray that you uh, open our spiritual hearts and minds, Lord, as we listen to your word. Bless your servant, Lord. You bless your word, Father God. And Holy Spirit, minister to your people now. And may you guide us into all truth this morning, Lord. And Lord, we give you all glory, honor, and praise, Father God. This is our prayer in Jesus' name. And everyone will say, Amen and amen. I invite the people of God to please come to the altar to receive our tithes and offerings. God bless. in the house of the Lord on a Sunday morning like this. How many of you have uh, seen the news last night? Some, uh, some of you probably didn't know what happened last night. Iran just attacked Israel with about 300 ballistic missiles, cruise missiles and drones, and that's for the first time that ever happened in the 75-year history of Israel with regards to Iran. So, uh, 
What I would like to do this morning, and I don't want to sound too serious to you, because this is the Lord today. This is the day that the Lord has made. We will rejoice and be glad in it. But I would like you to give uh, the word your full attention, not that you don't every Sunday morning. I know that you do. In fact, uh, this is one of the best audience to preach to. I know I've been preaching here for 35 years, so I know, I know that. Uh, but I'd like you to turn your cell phones off. Um, if you haven't done so, thank you very much. I'd like you to give your full attention this morning. Uh, if you couldn't hear me from the back, I'd like you to transfer to the front side. There's a few uh, vacant chairs. Because I'm going to talk to you about what Jesus has mentioned in Luke chapter 21, verse 28. He said, and I quote, now this is not in the outline. I didn't put a specific text on the outline because I'm going to go through quite a few verses of scripture this morning. So guys, uh, at the media center there, if you could flash it on the screen, Luke 21, 20, 28 where it says, now when these things begin to happen, look up and lift up your heads because your redemption draws nigh. Amen. So uh, I'd like you to bow down your heads and close your eyes. We will pray. Thank you, Lord, for uh, bringing us to the house of God this morning. Thank you for waking us up with the joy of the Lord. Thank you, Lord, for allowing us to see these things in our generation, in our time. And thank you for preparing your church for what is about to happen in the world. We give you praise. We give you glory in Jesus' mighty name. And everyone say amen. amen. I believe uh, that we will probably talk about one of the most important messages that we have ever talked about in this pulpit for many, many years. And it's not because I'm the one preaching. Somebody could have done this this morning. So Jesus in Luke 21, 28 gave us uh, something to think about. He said, when you see these things begin to happen, look up for your redemption, draw it nigh. So what things is he talking about? He's talking about signs that we need to watch in order for us to know the seasons and the times according to what the Bible has spoken will happen prior to the coming of Jesus Christ. I believe with all my heart, I could be wrong, but my conviction tells me, uh, as far as what I know from God's word, that the coming of Jesus is very, very close. And that, if you are a child of God this morning, that ought to make you really happy. But at the same time, I don't want you to be disturbed with what's going on around us because there are signs that are literally screaming before our faces. In other words, you don't have to look for them. You don't have to wait for them. They are happening even as we speak. What I would like to talk to you about, and this is going to be probably a little bit longer than uh, what would normally take for a message to be done on a Sunday morning. So uh, I know you have done that bef you have not done that before, but don't sleep on me. Can you promise that? Okay, thank you, thank you. So what I, I'm not going to talk about all the signs. There's a lot of them. What I would like to talk to you about are the three prominent end time signs that are upon us. And those three signs are the following. Signs in the heavens, signs on the earth, and signs of the nation of Israel. Those are the three, I believe, and not only me, but a lot of Bible scholars agree, that the most important signs that are really occurring even in our time right now. So the first one is the signs in the heavens. Now, why do we 
need to know the signs. Because the signs will tell us what time in God's calendar are we in. In other words, if you know the signs that have been given to you beforehand, then you would know what time of the day and what time are the things that Jesus has spoken about will happen because they are written in the scriptures. One of those things are signs in the heavens. So for thousands of years, God has been giving signs in the heavens about his plans and about his purposes for mankind. Now, as you know, the heavens is composed of basically three things. The sun, the moon, and the stars. Uh, you will be, it just actually occurred to me not too long ago, that before God created the sun and the moon and the stars, there was already light. Now, figure that out. Because in the story of creation in Genesis chapter 1, in verse 3, the Bible says God created light. And then in verse 14 and 16, he created the big lights in the heavens, the sun, the moon, and the stars. So even before the sun and the moon and the stars appeared, God already created light. So you might say, how can that be? If there's no sun, there's no moon, there's no stars, how could there be light in the universe? Don't forget that God is, God is a God of light. So he doesn't need sun to uh, aid him, to help him produce light because he himself is light. So what's the reason why God created the sun, the moon, and the stars? How many of you know there are reasons that God, the Bible gave? Now, we're not normally aware about this, but it's actually in the Bible. In Genesis chapter 1, verse 14, the Bible gave us three reasons why God created the sun, the moon, and the stars. Number one, God created these heavenly bodies for seasons. Number two, for days and years. And number three, for signs. So when God created the moon, the stars, and the sun, he created them, first of all, for determining the seasons of the year. How many of you know that the sun and the moon has something to do with the reason why we have four seasons on earth? Summers, uh, spring, uh, fall, and winter. Depending on the position of the earth relative to the sun, you're going to have summer, you're going to have winter, you're going to have fall, you're going to have spring. So that's number one is seasons. Number two are days and years. One circling of the earth to the sun equals one year. That's 365 days, six hours and nine minutes to be exact. But number three is what fascinates me because... This is something that a lot of people don't know and ignore because we're not aware that when God created the sun and the moon and the stars, he created them as a sign or four signs. In other words, God will use the sun, the moon, and the stars as signs so that we can know his plans and his purposes on earth. Do we have samples of that in the scriptures? Yes. One of the oldest and probably the most prominent of them all in the scripture is the star of Bethlehem. One of the oldest signs that God used is the star of Bethlehem. Now we find the star of Bethlehem in Matthew chapter 2. But how many of you know that that was prophesied in the Old Testament? In the book of Numbers 24 verse 17. The word that was used in Hebrew is the word kochav, which is singular for the word star. Now, how do we know that the Bible is not only talking about figurative or symbolical language, but the Bible is actually talking about a literal star? Because if you go back to Genesis 1.16, when the Bible said God created the stars, it's the same word that was used only in the plural form. It's kochavim, as opposed to kochav, which is the singular uh, Hebrew word for the word star, meaning the Bible is saying that the Bethlehem star is not a figurative language. What do I mean by that? We normally use the word star in a figurative language, like Hollywood stars, right? So if you are famous as a singer, you are a star. The Bible is not talking about that. The Bible is talking about a literal star. And then we have verses in the Bible that talks about signs in the heavenly bodies. For example, in Joel chapter 2, verses 3 to 13, flash that on the screen. 
the Bible says that God will show wonders in the heavens. Sun will darken the moon into blood before the coming of the great and awesome day of the Lord. Now, I'd like you to watch this phrase. When the Bible talks about the day of the Lord, it talks about the great tribulation period. So whenever you see the, the phrase, the day of the Lord, or the terrible day of the Lord, it talks about the great tribulation period. So the Bible said in the book of Joel that God will show signs in the sky. Signs in the sun, signs in the moon, signs in the star before the great and terrible day of the Lord. Now you might say, Pastor, we've been seeing signs for a long time. Well, go again to Joel chapter 3 verses 1 to 3 because the Bible gave us a time frame in which God will begin to show the signs in the sky. So in that way, you would know, aha, this is what the Bible is talking about. What's the time frame in Joel chapter 3, verses 1 to 3? Here's what God said. When I gather Israel in the land, when the nation of Israel becomes a nation again, which happened in 1948, then God is saying, you will see these signs in the sky. So it's not that old. The time frame is basically 75 years. From 2024, go back to 1948, that's 75 years. So God is saying in Joel that when I regather my nation Israel in the land, you will begin to see the signs in the sky. So it's not that old. You have a time frame so that you know that it's specifically referring to the second coming of Jesus Christ. Again, in the New Testament, Jesus mentioned the signs of the sun, the moon, and the stars. In Matthew chapter 24, verse 29, and in Luke chapter 21, verse 25. In Matthew 24, Jesus said, the sun will be darkened and the moon will not give its light. When do you think it happened during the time of Jesus in the Gospels that there was actually an eclipse? The Bible recorded it. In Luke chapter 23, verse 44, the Bible said, when Jesus died on the cross, there was darkness in the land from 6 hours to the ninth hour. That's 12 in the afternoon to 3 o'clock in the afternoon. That's 3 hours. Now, I've read a lot of commentaries about this, and one of the commentaries say, well, the darkness is caused by the millions of demons that gathered on top of the cross because they were celebrating that the Son of God is finally dead. I read that, and I said, wait a minute. That's not true, because demons are spirits. And when you are a spirit, you're invisible. And if you're invisible, it's impossible for you to block the rays of the sun from coming through. So it's not true. So another other, uh, commentaries that I've read said, that's an eclipse. And if it's an eclipse, it's one of the longest eclipses ever recorded in the history of mankind because it lasted for three hours, from 12 to 3 in the afternoon. If that is an eclipse, we just had one last Monday, April 8, 2024. How many of you have seen it? Well, we are not in Texas. But uh, have you tried? Anyone has tried? Raise your hand. You put your uh, eclipse glasses on and you see, did you see something? I'm going to give you three eclipse perspectives. Okay, now, what are the possible perspectives for an eclipse? Number one, entertainment. So millions of people tried to capture that once-in-a-lifetime experience of getting dark at around 11.30 in the morning. How many of you know that if you bought a ticket going to Texas, Illinois, Missouri, in the Midwest, it will cost you probably three times the normal airfare because hundreds of thousands of people went there to observe this eclipse once-in-a-lifetime experience. That's number one is entertainment. Number two is scientific perspective. The scientists were observing the eclipse and in the previous eclipses because they would like to know how nature reacts to it. And they were observing, some of them were observing in the zoos and how the animals behave when it gets dark midday. And apparently they're trying to get some scientific perspective out of it. But number three is the most interesting to me based on what Jesus said would be the signs in the heavens. And that is prophetic perspective. What is the meaning of this eclipse in the light of what Jesus 
have sinned. Well, first of all, let me, let me tell you this, and you can Google this. I mean, nowadays, you don't have to have a degree to know a lot of facts. You go to Google, it will tell you. Okay? So, we experience 81 total eclipses, in other words, total darkness, 81 of them in the 20th century, starting in 1901. So, 124 years from now, going back to 1901, we had 81 total eclipses. So, it's not really rare, that rare. It happens uh, off and on for a, maybe a, a span of about 50 years or so. But let me ask you a question this morning. What's the difference between this eclipse that happened last Monday and the eclipses that happened in the past? And I'm talking about total eclipse. You probably are not aware. I was not either. But let me tell you something. How many of you remember what happened in August 21 of 2017? Anybody? I know, I know. You have to have a selective memory to remember what happened in August 21, 2017. There was a total eclipse dubbed the eclipse of the century, the great American eclipse. I brought my, fam my family to the Santa Cruz Mountain trying to catch, if we can, a glimpse of that eclipse. I remember that vividly. And now, now you probably, some of you would remember that. But what's the relationship between the eclipse of 2017 and the eclipse of 2024? Guys, can you show the picture? That map of the United States? Can you see? There you go. Okay. You see that? Okay. This is the eclipse of 2017. This is the eclipse of last Monday. Okay? It crossed, intersected in a little town somewhere in Missouri, close to something that I'm going to tell you about. So, eclipses are normal, but intersecting eclipses are not. And this is one of those. So, the eclipse of 2024 cross the path of the eclipse of 2017. What's the historical significance of that? Now, again, if you're not really looking for it, you probably will not find it. But I'm going to tell you something that will probably catch your interest this morning. Listen, because it's not going to be in the outline. 200 years ago, let's go back 200 years ago. June 16, 1806. There was a solar eclipse in basically the same area. And then after that, barely seven, eight years, September 17, 1811, another solar eclipse intersected the one on June 16, 1806. So this thing happened 200 years ago in the United States. Now guess what? It happened on the same spot that in it intersected last Monday. Not exactly on the same spot, but in the vicinity. I'm going to tell you what history will tell us this morning. But here's the significance of that eclipses in 1806 and 1811. Three months after the last eclipse of September 17, 1811, on December 16, 1811, three months after the last two eclipses, the two biggest earthquakes in the history of the United States occurred. Number one is the first earthquake of December 16, 1811. By the size of the damage and by the estimates of modern day scientists that have now the instruments to figure it out, it could be somewhere between 801 to 8.2 on the Richter scale. The shaking was felt as far as Washington, D.C., where the president of the United States then was James Madison, and his wife reported it. The coverage of the earthquake was so big, it started from the Midwest to the south and to the east coast. And they didn't know where it came from because there's no internet back in the day. There's no TV stations back in the day. There's no, there's no radio back in the day. The radio wasn't invented until about 1869. So what they relayed on, relied on, was newspaper reports. How many of you know that newspapers was the oldest means of communication? 
it's still preserved nowadays. That's the reason why we have this history. So that's the first earthquake. The second earthquake occurred about three months after that, February 7, 1812. They estimated this to be 8.8, and here's the reason why. The boat operators on the Mississippi River were reporting, they reported it to the newspapers, that while the earthquake was going on, the water of the Mississippi literally flowed backward. Now, the Mississippi is the second largest river in the United States. It's, it's, it's wide, it's big. They have shipping lanes in the river. And the boat operators were saying that literally the water was flowing backward because of the violence of the upheaval on the earth beneath the river. And that's the reason why they say it's about 8.8. Now, we know the earthquake as the new Madrid fault centered in the town of New Madrid in Missouri. How do we know that? There's archives in the town of New Madrid. Go to Google, you will find it. That's in there. The records were kept through the newspaper. Fast forward 200 years in our time last Monday, April 8, 2024, the eclipses intersected. And by the way, the difference of 2017 and 2024 is seven years. If that rings a bell to you, that should make you think twice. They intersected on exactly almost the same spot that it happened 200 years ago around the area of New Madrid, Missouri. What we call now is the New Madrid, Missouri Fault. Coincidence? Let me ask you something. If you are a writer, if you're writing something and you cross out something, what are you trying to do? You're trying to eliminate something. You're trying to cross. That means I don't want that. I'm going to change it. Now, I don't want to scare you, but that's when the modern day pastors who have prophetic giftings began to get worried. And I'm going to tell you one instance. One of them dreamed about this in 2008. He shared this dream on TVN, and I was able to watch it. He said, I had a dream, and the Lord showed me in my dream letters that I don't know where. He said, New Madrid. And I said, Lord, was New Madrid? So when he woke up, he Googled New Madrid, and it's in Missouri. Exactly the same spot. That was 2008. And the Lord showed him in that dream that a big, big earthquake is going to happen in a few years from that dream on. And that was 2008. Now, why am I mentioning this to you? Because in Amos chapter 3, verse 78, this is what God said. God says God doesn't do nothing on earth unless he reveals his secrets to the prophets. In other words, whenever God plans to do something, he will reveal it to someone, one of his servants. And I believe, because I've, I've, I've heard other stories, not only... Did this pastor dream about it? But several pastors who have known prophetic gifting in the body of Christ have dreamed about a major earthquake that is going to happen somewhere in the United States. Let's set that aside for a moment. How many of you know, remember the blood moons of 2015? The four blood moons of 2015. It was 2015, 2016. Immediately after that, December 6, 2017, something happened. How many of you know, remember, like, again, again, that's forgivable because unless you have a selective mind and you're looking for this, you will find it. But in December 6, 2017, Jerusalem was declared as the eternal capital of Israel for the first time in 2,000 years. A foreign power declared it. And a lot of people don't like the guy, but I'm going to tell you who he is then President Donald J. Trump. He declared Jerusalem as the capital of Israel. Now, here's my question to you. Will something happen in the next few days, months, maybe years, because of this, because Jesus said, watch out for the signs in the heavens? Yesterday, around 3 o'clock, as I was putting the final touches on this message, 
a sister in the church texts me. She said, Pastor, do you know that Iran is beginning to attack Israel at this point in time? So I jumped from my office in the basement, went up the stairs, turned the TV on, and lo and behold, Jerusalem in the night sky was like fireworks because hundreds and hundreds of ballistic missiles were raining on Israel last night. And thank God, no major damage because God protected his land. Let's give the Lord a big hand this morning. Here's the number of drones and missiles and ballistic. Ballistic missiles is a serious one. 170 drones, 30 cruise missiles, 120 ballistic missiles coming from Iran. That's the first time it ever happened in 75 years of Israel's history. And that's the reason I like you to watch out because Israel will retaliate. We don't know how, we don't know when, we don't know what kind, but this is going to get bigger before it settles down. I don't believe it's going to settle down. That's the first sign, sign in the heaven, signs on the earth. This is very interesting. It's new to me. I don't know about this before. Signs of the earth. Jesus mentioned specifically earthquakes as one of the signs in the earth. Matthew chapter 24, verse 7. In other words, Jesus is saying, as his coming gets nearer, we will experience more and more earthquakes of higher and bigger magnitude. Now, what I would like to do this morning is go deeper than simply understanding what earthquakes are because there is an intimate relationship between man on, and the earth. In other words, this ground that I'm standing on is more than, more than just a place where I could put my foot on and stand on it. There is a deeper relationship between man and the earth. Some of you are guessing what it is. Here's what it is. Number one, how many of you know that Adam was made from the dust of the ground? Amen. So from that day on, every single person that is born on the face of the earth is made of dirt. So if you are trying to be proud of your achievements this morning, don't. Because however we have accomplished everything, we shouldn't be proud because we are made of dirt. Amen. That's not something to be proud of. Okay. In fact, science will tell you that a human body and the earth share similar elements in many, many areas. But here's what's interesting to me. Listen very carefully. Do you know that the earth reacts to how we behave as human beings? We never thought that. I never thought that until I understood what's going on in the Bible. That the earth reacts to how we behave as human beings. There's a connection between man sinning and earth reacting. In other words, the more humankind sin, the more earth reacts. I'll give you an example. In the Garden of Eden, in Genesis chapters 1 to 3. Before Adam and Eve sinned, the earth was working perfectly in order and wonderful. It's a paradise to live in the Garden of Eden, right? I mean, how many of you would have wished that you were born in the Garden of Eden? Yeah, you don't have to work. You don't have to do anything. You just speak. You just, sometimes you probably have to speak the word and things will be there. But when Adam and Eve sinned, earth and nature rebelled against man. How do we know that? The earth started producing thorns and thistles. We have to labor in order to get something good out of the ground. So if you don't like your jobs now and you're going to be back there again tomorrow, blame Adam for that. Because if he didn't do it, you probably will be the boss instead of the subordinate. But listen, the more we sin, the more pronounced our sins are, the more disasters of nature occur. So from the day that Adam and Eve sinned, we have earthquakes, we have tornadoes, we have hurricanes, we have all kinds of natural disasters. As if nature has a language of its own. That's it. It does. Nature has a language of its own. Look at the Bible, Isaiah 55, 12. 
the trees of the field shall clap their hands. Wow. It's a beautiful way of saying, well, nature speaks. Psalms 19 verse 1. The heavens declare the glory of God. Luke chapter 19 verse 40. Jesus said, if you don't praise me, the stones will cry out. So nature has some kind of a language of its own, whether you take it literally or figuratively. Now, how do we know that the more we sin, the more earth reacts violently? We're given that account in Genesis chapter 6, verse 5. In the book of Genesis chapter 6, verse 5, it says, The wickedness of men became so great on the earth that the flood has to come to judge mankind. Now, here's what's interesting to me, because in Matthew chapter 24, verse 37, Jesus said this, and I quote, as it was in the days of Noah. Listen, so shall it be in the days of the Son of Man. What is the meaning of that? What was the day of Noah? Wickedness was everywhere. And so nature reacted and the flood was sent. So here's the days of the Son of Man. As wickedness will be even greater, earthquakes and disasters will also increase in magnitude. Sin getting worse, earthquakes and disasters getting worse. That's the intimate relationship between man and earth and nature. What's the strongest evidence of the relationship between the two? I'll give you one word. Millennium. How many of you know that Jesus will reign for a thousand years on earth when he comes back? Amen? So that, that's a glorious thing to think about that one of these days there shall be no more pain, no more death, no more sorrow. We will live with Jesus and reign with him for a thousand years on earth. Now, the book of Isaiah 65 actually describes that what, what kind of earth will it be when Jesus reigns for a thousand years? Dramatic change. 6520 of Isaiah. It says that age will increase dramatically that if you are 100 years old, you're going to be a baby. Now, I don't want to ask you if anyone close to 100 years old here today, but definitely you're not a baby if you're 80, 90, or 100. What are you? Can I use the word Old. I'm, I'm one of those, old. But during the time of the millennium, you will be a young people when you are 300 years old. You're going to be dunking basketball when you are 200 years old. You're, go you're going to be running the marathon when you are 200 years old. Here's another one. Nature will completely change. Isaiah 65, 25. The animal kingdom will change back to the original intent that God made it in the Garden of Eden. It says the wolf and the lamb will feed together. Wolf and lamb. Try putting them together today. The lamb will be lunch for the wolf. In those days, they will eat together. Lions will eat straw like the ox, and there's no violence. Why is that? I'll tell you why. Because the Bible told us. Satan, at that 1,000 years, will be bound in the bottomless pit. There's no sin on earth, folks. There is no temptation on earth for 1,000 years. And therefore, earth will be back to what God has created it to be in the Garden of Eden for 1,000 years. Because Satan is bound, plus obviously, Jesus will reign for 1,000 years. The last verse that I'm going to give you is something that we quote a lot. Second Chronicles 7.14. How many of you know that verse by heart? If my people which are called by my name shall humble themselves and pray and seek my face, then will I hear from heaven and will forgive their sins and what? Heal their land. There's a healing of the land when people repent. That's sign number two. Sign number three is very interesting. The sign of the nation of Israel. I've mentioned this several times. That the nation of Israel is God's timetable in the fulfillment of the prophecies as far as the second coming of Jesus Christ is concerned. Right now as we speak, 
as in the past, practically the whole world does not like the nation of Israel. Demonstrations everywhere. I think it was last Sunday we were going home and we saw this, uh, there's the overpasses that crosses 101. Palestinian demonstrators stopped supporting Israel, etc., etc. I'm going to ask you something. How many of you remember what happened in February of 2022? Putin invaded Ukraine and killed hundreds of thousands of Ukrainians. There was no demonstration. Nothing. In fact, for a few months after that, nobody even talks about Russia anymore. Not now. Israel was invaded in October 7 of 2023. And Israel has to re retaliate because it's a duty of a country to defend itself. Demonstrations happen worldwide. And the nation of Israel is on the map for seven months from October until now. Why is that? And it didn't happen with a bigger event in February of 2022. Why? Because satanic influence is on the move. Because if Satan can destroy the nation of Israel, God would not be able to fulfill his promise. But I know from reading the Bible, it's not going to happen. The nation of Israel will stand as it is. Okay, something is going on in Israel right now as we speak. I'm going to show you a picture. Guys, can you show the picture of an animal there on the screen? There. You know what they are? Cows. I'm going to ask you a question. Can a cow start World War III? <laughs> Pastor, did you, did you ask the right question? I'm going to repeat the question again. Can a cow start World War III? The answer is yes. How? Well, let's give a background. Those are not ordinary cows. They are what we call the red heifers. What's the difference between a heifer and a cow? A cow, if it gave birth, is a cow. A cow that has not given birth up to about three years old is called a heifer. And these are red heifers. What's the significance of these animals in the Bible? In Numbers chapter 19, verses 2 to 22, the Lord gave Moses a command to the nation of Israel that before you could start temple sacrifices and temple worship, you need to cleanse the priest in the nation of Israel with the ashes of the red heifer. The red heifer has to be at least three years old, no more than that, no younger than one year old. And they have to be perfectly red. That's the reason why red heifers are not easy to raise and breed. Because... It's not easy to raise a cow that is completely 100% red. So God said to Moses, you will burn them as a sacrifice. You will mix the ashes of the red heifer with water. You will sprinkle it to the priest and then the people. And then you can begin temple sacrifices and worship. The Jews have been trying to raise red heifers for as long as anyone can remember. And sometimes they would raise one, and after one year, a, a black hair or one white hair would grow, and the heifer would be disqualified. One hair. That's how perfect they are. You know what they do? The rabbis would run a magnifying glass all throughout the red heifer from the head to the tail, and if they find one hair that is not red, they will disqualify the cow. What's the meaning of that? Because the red heifers represent the blood of Jesus. The blood of Jesus, how many of you know, is perfect, 100% red. It could not be contaminated by other things. That's why the book of Hebrews says, the blood of the goats and the bulls, referring to the red heifers and other animal sacrifices. Here's the question. What's going on with these red heifers now? The Jews want to sacrifice them now even though there's no temple in Jerusalem, because this is what they believe. They believe that the moment they sacrifice the red heifer, they will usher in the times of the Messiah. 
In other words, even though the Dome of the Rock is there where the temple used to stand, the Dome of the Rock is the second uh, holiest shrine of the Muslims, the Jews believe that somehow the Dome of the Rock will be destroyed by some supernatural means so that when they start sacrificing the red heifer, that Dome of the Rock will be replaced by a temple. So they are planning to sacrifice the red heifer between April 22, which is about one week from now, until about September of 2024. We have a period of about a few months. The red heifers... And here's the question, do they have the red heifers now? Yes, they do. Yes, they do. And here's the story of the red heifer. The Jews, the rabbis were sent to the United States and they somehow got connected with a Christian rancher by the name of Byron Stimson. He raises cows. And he said to the rabbis, I can raise and breed red heifers. You know how much they paid him for the five red heifers? $500,000. $100,000 for a cow. I'll be a rancher if I could raise a red heifer for $100,000 for a cow. So these red heifers were born in the pandemic year of 2021. So the rancher was able to raise more than five, but they needed five in Jerusalem. How many of you remember what happened during the pandemic? Everything was shut down, right? The governments were not working. Government people were not working. And here's what you need to understand. If a cattle is born in your runs in the United States, if that runs is registered with the government, that cattle has to be ear tagged. That's the reason why you have tags in the ears of the cattle. An inspector from the USDA would come and tag your cattle, and it, it would say that the year it was born. The pandemic came, and these red heifers were born during the pandemic. And because it's a pandemic, no U.S. inspector came. Which means that if they were tagged, they would be automatically disqualified. But because of the pandemic, they grew up to be the year that the Jews would need them. And so they were shipped in Jerusalem in a big fanfare. The news covered it. In fact, the American news covered it as well. September of 2022. And they are now ready to be sacrificed. Before they were shipped, the rabbis went to Texas. And I was reading an article about it. In fact, CBS News covered it uh, for about an hour. And they were bringing with them magnifying glasses, glasses they were scouring all throughout the skins of the red heifer, and they passed because they didn't find any white hair or black hair. And up to this day, four of them are still qualified. One was disqualified. They are ready to be sacrificed in probably the next week. Now, probably will not believe this, but again, the information is available on the Internet. Here's to top it all. Hamas released an official video on January 14, 2024, 100 days after the invasion of Israel in October of 2023. You know what they said? We invaded Israel because Israel brought red heifers into the land. I said, what? So I started Googling it, and here it is. The video was there. The official spokesman of Hamas released a video. And it says the reason why he invaded Israel is because Israel brought in red heifers in the land. You know what that means? They actually believe that the moment they sacrifice the red heifer, then the dome of the rock will be destroyed. Hamas are ideological people. They work by their religious belief. They believe that whatever are prophesied in Bible or Quran, they believe they will happen. And so they say the reason why we invaded Israel to disrupt the offering of the red heifer. They called that invasion Al-Aqsa Flood, meaning the cause of the Dome of the Rock. I'm going to end this up with a word. Coincidence? No. I don't believe so. I believe that we are going to a point in history where the end times are upon us. And Jesus is probably right by the door, ready to snatch his church 
Now, you might ask, and this is further discussions in the future, what will inaugurate the Great Tribulation period? The Bible told us what in Revelation 6? War. A major war in the Middle East will start the Great Tribulation period. Hamas is an operative of Iran. Everybody knows that. And Hezbollah. The last night, they didn't use their proxies. They attacked Israel personally and directly. The Holy Spirit is blowing the wind of change in the Middle East to hasten the second coming of Jesus Christ. I've been praying to the Lord in the last few months. I said, Lord, how do we prepare your people? And the Lord seemingly is saying, just tell him, tell him what the Bible talks about, the signs of the times. So if you're a child of God this morning, continue to serve the Lord. Even though there's trials, there's tribulations, continue to serve the Lord because the Bible said the sufferings of this world are not worthy to be compared with the glory that will be revealed unto us one of these days. If you have not committed your life to Jesus Christ, and you go to a church like this, but you have not really committed your life, this is the time to do it. You don't want to be in this world when the tribulation period happens and begins. Because Jesus said this, and I quote, he said that when the great tribulation period happens, it has never happened before, and it will never happen again. And Jesus said, those days has to be shortened, or else no one will survive. It's going to be a horrible, horrible time on earth. We were talking with our relatives in the Philippines. You know what they say? For the first time in the history of the Philippines, as far as they know, they are suspending classes because it's too hot. It used to be, I mean, you know, when we were growing up in the Philippines, the only time that they will suspend classes is if it's going to be typhoon signal number three. And we were rejoicing whenever they announced that because we don't have to go to school. Nowadays, they're suspending classes because it's too hot. You're talking about the Philippines that you and I grew up. Times are changing because Jesus is coming back. Let's all stand up. Hallelujah. Bow down your heads with me. Close your eyes. This is the best time to commit your life to Christ. Even if Jesus doesn't come back in the next year or two, we don't know when death is going to come. That does not, does not knock on the door of your life and say, prepare yourself. I'm going to take you in the next three days. It's always good to be prepared. There's only one way to prepare. For the second coming of Jesus Christ. Make sure that you are a child of God. There's only one way to be a child of God. Through his son, Jesus Christ. Jesus said in John 14, 6, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father but through me. How do you accept Jesus? Simple. Accept. Maybe through prayer. Maybe through repentance. I'd like you to bow down your head and close your eyes. If you have not committed your life to Christ, follow me in a simple prayer. Lord Jesus Christ, come into my heart this morning. Thank you for dying on the cross for my sin. Thank you for paying for the penalties of my sin. I accept you into my life as my Lord and my Savior. From now on, I'd like to live my life for you. Thank you for being my Savior. Thank you, Father, for writing my name in the Lamb's book of life. Thank you for the promise of your second coming. I surrender my life to you. In Jesus' name, amen. Father, I pray for the rest of my brethren this morning. As we see that all of these things are beginning to occur, even as we speak, I pray that we will be on fire for Jesus. That we will, if we are serving now, we will continue to serve him for the rest of our lives. Help us to glorify your name as a church. We give you praise. We give you glory. In Jesus' name, this is our prayer. And I pray that you will bless every household, every husband, every wife, every child. Put a heads of protection around its family that attends Crossroads Christian Center. And may your name be glorified in every family, in every household in the midst of us. Be with us the rest of the week until you gather us back again next Sunday with the joy of the Lord in our hearts. 
In Jesus' mighty name, this is our prayer. And everyone say, Amen. 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 God bless you.